I invite you to turn to your confession of faith in the back. In the back of your hymnals. Westminster Confession, chapter 29. We'll be looking at paragraphs 3 and 4 tonight. I'm going to begin reading from 1 Corinthians 11, a familiar passage to us all in this church. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 to 26. Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we can return once again to your word and to this portion of our confession that explores this sacrament that you've given to us, this gift of your supper. We pray, Lord, that you would teach us, um, that you would instruct us and guide us to a right understanding of, of this uh, rich blessing that you have uh, given and entrusted to your church in the Lord's Supper. In Jesus' name, amen. Our Confession of Faith, chapter 29, paragraph 3, says, The Lord Jesus hath in this ordinance appointed his ministers to declare his word of institution to the people, to pray and bless the elements of bread and wine, and thereby to set them apart from a common to an holy use, and to take and break the bread, to take the cup, and they communicating also themselves, to give both to the communicants, but to none who are not then present in the congregation. And so if you can think back to paragraphs 1 and 2, those paragraphs dealt with what the Lord's Supper is and what the Lord's Supper is not. And now here in paragraphs 3 and 4, uh, the confession is concerned with the right administration of the Lord's Supper. In paragraph 3, the assembly tells us that Jesus has appointed his ministers to oversee the administration of the sacrament. Uh, when the supper was instituted, Jesus, of course, presided over the meal as the chief minister, and then he passed that responsibility to the twelve, who were also apostles. Uh, and now in Ephesians 2, it tells us that the church has been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, and so the apostles and prophets are the foundation of the church, which means the apostolic age is no more, the office of apostles no more, because there's only one foundation, right, for a building. Uh, the book of Acts, along with the pastoral epistles, they show us that the apostles have passed the baton to ministers, pastors, and elders. Uh, each local church, we know from scripture, is to be governed by a pastor and a plurality of elders. And it's specifically the pastor, the, the minister, who's been set apart to administer the sacraments. He not only administers the preached word, but also the sacramental word, because a pastor is a minister of the word. And so when we do the supper each month, you'll notice that the very first thing I do is I read the words of institution from Scripture, from one passage, 1 Corinthians 11, maybe Luke 22 or somewhere else. Um, I turn to a text about uh, the Lord's Supper to ground this ancient practice in the word of God. Right? It's not something we invented, it's something that the Lord invented and gave to us. And I also pray over the meal, as the confession talks about, thanking the Lord for all of his mercies in Christ, for the picture of the gospel that he's given to us in the supper, and ask the Lord to bless the sacrament and to bless us, his people. Now, through this prayer, uh, the Lord sets the sacrament apart from a common use, the confession says, to a holy use or from an ordinary use to an extraordinary use. And then, as the assembly writes, I take the bread and break it, just as Jesus did in the upper room, to signify his broken and beaten and crucified body given to us. And, and the elders then assist me in distributing the bread and the cup to the communicant members of the church, to the professing members of the church. And all of this is in keeping what, with what we see uh, at the institution of the sacrament and in places like 1 Corinthians 11. 
So it's fairly fa straightforward stuff, rather, this, this paragraph. Um, the confession outlines the basics here of right administration of the sacrament. These are the things that are required uh, because they're reflected in the Bible, either by command or by example. But there's a lot that this paragraph doesn't actually say. Um, I'm sure that many of you have worshipped with other Reformed congregations um, before, and perhaps you noticed that, well, they did the supper a little bit differently than we do here. For instance, we partake of the elements together, right? We, we distribute them, and then we all partake together, um, because we believe here, the session does, that this reflects the unity of, of the church that's talked about uh, in 1 Corinthians 10, 17, for instance, which talks about the church and the Lord's Supper together. Paul writes, because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. And so that's why we partake together. But there are other Reformed churches and other Protestant churches in general who might not do that. They might not have the elements together. Uh, for instance, in some churches, I've been in a church like this, a PCA church, in fact, where you were asked to silently pray. And then when you were ready, uh, you would walk up to the front and receive the bread um, and, and the wine from an, a ruling elder. Okay? And now we don't do that because, as I said, uh, we believe that taking the elements together reflects that corporate nature of the church and the sacrament. But that doesn't mean that other churches are unfaithful because they don't do things exactly like we do. Um, now, there is one practice that maybe some of you are familiar with, something that's not mentioned in our confession, um, called intinction. Uh, maybe that's a term some of you have heard before. Um, it, it's not something I would say is, is unfaithful or heretical, but it's certainly unorthodox. Uh, intinction, if you don't know, is where you dip the bread in the wine and then eat the bread. Okay? And this practice has a long history. Actually, it date ba dates back to the 4th century AD. Um, some Catholic churches practice intinction. Um, some PCA churches practice intinction. A minority, but some still do. And, and so probably other Reformed congregations as well. We don't know how or why this practice uh, came about. Some think it had to do with um, moistening the bread to make it easier for, for shut-ins and the sick to eat or the elderly. Um, others link it to pedo communion to make it easier for infants to have the bread. But it's not totally clear how and why it originated. All that to say that this practice is out there. Um, not heretical, but I don't think it's right either. Uh, Luke 22 plainly says that Jesus gave the bread to the disciples first. And then they ate it, and they gave the cup, and they drank it. So the bread and the wine shouldn't be combined, um, they should remain separate. So that's a practice, just to familiarize yourself, maybe you've heard that before, maybe not. Now the last thing that paragraph 3 mentions about right administration is something interesting uh, that's worth our time uh, to, to talk about a bit, is that the supper is not to be given to any who are not then present in the congregation. Okay, this idea also carries over into the fourth paragraph, the first line, if you read that real fast, about the inappropriateness, we're told, of private masses or receiving this sacrament by a priest or any other alone. Now, one key reason for this um, is the nature of the Lord's Supper. Uh, paragraph one, if we back up there, says that this sacrament is a sign and seal not just of our communion with Christ, our risen Savior, but also our communion with each other as his body, as the one body of Christ. And so the supper then, there's this uh, essential corporate and, and public dimension to this meal. It's to be received in worship. And furthermore, 1 Corinthians 11 says that the Corinthians had the supper, a few times it says this, that they had the supper when they gathered together as the church. Yeah, that's important. So this means that individual believers are not the church. We are members of the church, but the church in the Greek is literally the, the assembly of believers. So when the, the members gather together, the church has gathered. Okay? And this is, of course, reflected also in the institution of the Lord's Supper. Jesus, if you think about it, uh, maybe you've never thought about this before, but he did not administer the supper 
12 individual times in the upper room, one time for each disciple. Um, no, they all got around the dinner table and they all broke bread and, and drank wine together. They had one meal. And so the nature of the sacrament, along with the biblical examples that we have of the supper, tell us that there's this indispensable corporate and public uh, dimension to the sacrament, which would then exclude private masses practiced in the Catholic Church, which are, again, mentioned in paragraph 4. And now an important qualification here is though these kinds of private events are excluded, is that it is a practice in our church and many other Reformed churches to bring the Lord's Supper to shut-ins. Uh, to those who are uh, too sick to come to worship. Shut-ins especially, we know, need the means of grace. They need that encouragement. They need to be reminded visibly of Christ's love for them. And they can't make it to worship. They can't fellowship with God's people. And so it's especially important, uh, uh, I believe, to take the supper to shut-ins. This is a good practice for the church to observe. But having said that, I don't take this, the supper to shut-ins by myself. Right, because that would be a private affair. I take an elder along with me to help me administer and at least one other member of the church. Uh, since this is, after all, the sacrament called communion, so a communion of God's people should be present. Furthermore, if we take the supper to shut-ins, it's always on the Lord's Day. Okay, it's always after the morning service because we view it as a continuation or an extension of the worship service. And so that's an important qualification uh, to make about this issue of private masses. I would also say that only in extremely rare circumstances uh, would I personally be comfortable with believers administering the Lord's Supper to each other. And that's certainly out of the ordinary. For instance, if there are two Muslims who in Iran who can convert to Christ, you know, I'm not going to be the one to say that they can't have the supper together. Somebody else might say that. I wouldn't say that. Um, but outside of those kinds of really rare situations where there's just not a church around, but there are believers around, there's no minister, but there's Christians, you know, outside of those really rare situations and, and outside of shut-ins, the supper, we're reminded here in the confession, is not to be ordinarily a private event. Okay, this would mean... Also, that, that even though we live stream our services, those watching from home should not administer communion to themselves. Um, during the COVID lockdowns, it became really popular really fast to just virtualize everything about the church. Um, for a lot of churches, this meant virtualizing the Lord's Supper. Elders would, I guess, go around to the houses of their members and drop off the elements, or they would just tell you, you've got to get the bread and the wine yourself. And you'd all take communion together in the privacy of your own home while watching the pastor on your TV or your computer. I've talked about this issue before of virtual communion, so I won't belabor the point, but suffice it to say that, friends, some things can't be virtualized, and we really need to be clear on that. Um, some things cannot be virtualized. In fact, the vast majority of what the church does just can't be virtualized. Um, this is especially true of the means of grace. Um, even though we we live stream our services, so shut-ins or, or those who are out sick can, can participate in some way, watching the service, listening to the sermon, all that. They would much rather be in the service and be present in the service because that's how the means of grace were designed to be administered and received by uh, the saints. And now while we're on this topic of improper contexts for the supper, it should also be said that no Christian has the right to administer uh, the elements in his own home with his family. Um, I say this because in some extreme patriarchal circles, perhaps, there might be fathers who think that I have the authority as the household head to just distribute the sacrament to my family, but that's not the case. Uh, just as dads shouldn't baptize their kids, uh, dad also shouldn't administer the supper because the sacraments were not given to individual families. They're given to the church. And nor do groups of Christians have the authority to administer the supper themselves on a Friday night or a Saturday night, whenever, just because they think it would be a great spiritual thing to do. Um, and to make matters even more controversial, 
And the supper also shouldn't be administered at weddings. Um, this is popular at, at Catholic weddings, but it also happens at Protestant weddings too. Um, I've been to weddings where the pastor administered communion to the bride and groom, and it made me cringe a bit. Uh, for one thing, a wedding is not typically on the Lord's Day, which is the day when the means of grace are to be publicly observed and received by the church. And again, the supper isn't a private thing. Okay, where you, you take it, and then just everyone else who's there sits back and, and watches you take it. And even if everyone at the wedding was given the sacrament, this too wouldn't be appropriate because a wedding is not a gathering of the church. By its nature, weddings include some people, and they exclude others. They're by invitation, right? At Christian weddings, there's typically a mixture of believers with unbelievers in the audience. And so how do you administer the supper to a group like that? Uh, you've invited unbelievers to the wedding. Think about it. But now you're saying you can't participate in this part of the wedding, though. It's kind of awkward. Things get complicated really quickly. And so even though it looks spiritual, having the Lord's Supper at a wedding is anything but... Uh, the supper was not given to individual Christians to do with as they please. That's not how we should think about it. It was given to the church. To be received by the church in the context of the public gathering of the church in worship. It's a sign and seal of our communion with Christ and our communion with each other. And, and so outside of those rare exceptions I noted earlier, the supper is only to be administered in the public assembly of God's people. Now moving along to the next paragraph... Paragraph 4, I'll read it. We're told that private masses or receiving the sacrament by a priest or any other alone, as likewise the denial of the cup to the people, worshiping the elements, the lifting them up or carrying them about for adoration and the reserving them for any pretended religious use are all contrary to the nature of the sacrament and to the institution of Christ. As I said in the beginning, this paragraph is also concerned with the right administration of the Lord's Supper. We've already dealt with that issue of private masses. Uh, but this paragraph brings up other practices, all of which, as you might imagine, are tied to the Catholic Church. Um, one is denying the cup to the laity, to the people, and reserving it, by implication, just for the priests. Uh, this practice is not common anymore. I think it does still happen in maybe some places, but it's not common anymore. It arose, though, as all this other stuff does here. It arose from the doctrine of transubstantiation. Uh, the Catholic Church believes, for those who aren't familiar with that term, transubstantiation, it means that the bread and the wine, the Catholic Church believes, the bread and the wine transform into the actual body and blood of Christ. Uh, even though the elements still appear to be ordinary bread and wine just to our senses. Uh, the cup, then, holds the actual blood of Jesus when it's blessed by the priest. And so, what does that mean? Well, it means you've got to be really careful with the cup. Because you don't want to spill the blood of Jesus, literally. And then it would be wasted. That's what they believe. So how can the church prevent such a catastrophe from happening when you have all these people who are supposed to receive the cup? Well, let's just withhold it. <laughs> from the laity and give it only to the priests. And then you're asking maybe in your heads, well, won't the laity get upset with that? No. Why wouldn't they? Well, there's another doctrine right next to transubstantiation that the Catholic Church came up with, and this is called concomitance. Maybe you haven't heard of that before. Uh, what's concomitance? A. a. Hodge writes this in his commentary in the Confession. He says, to comfort the laity, they teach, the Catholic Church teaches, that as the blood of Christ is in the flesh, and as the soul is in the body, and as the divinity is in the soul of Christ, the whole person, body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ, is equally in every particle of the bread, so that he who receives the bread receives all. Did you follow that? In other words, the whole Christ is present in each element, the bread and the wine, so there's no need for the laity to have the cup because they get all of Jesus with just the bread. This teaching of concomitance is affirmed in the Council of Trent, that 16th century council that we've already 
talked about. Um, but of course, this whole idea of withholding part of the sacrament from the church, it's not just unbiblical. This is a gross and terrible offense against Christ and his people. Uh, Jesus gave both elements to his disciples, telling them to eat the bread, which they did, then they drank the cup. And the Corinthian leaders, 1 Corinthians 11, they served both elements, as we see, to their people, to the congregation. Nowhere is there any concern in Scripture, in the New Testament at all, about spilling the cup. Okay, as if it was the actual blood of Jesus, or dropping the bread for that matter. There's just no concern, nothing at all mentioned about that. Why? Because the bread and the wine are not the actual body and blood of Jesus. It's the doctrine of transubstantiation that, that led the reformers to label the mass as idolatrous. And you see why, based upon what the confession says next, where it lists all these other forbidden practices, again, that, that arise out of and flow from transubstantiation. Worshiping the elements, bowing to them, the priest lifting them up above his head and carrying them around for the purpose of adoration, and storing the leftover elements for use at another time. Why would they do that? Well, it's the body and blood of Jesus. You can't pour out the blood of Jesus in the sink. Right? So we store it for a later time. All of that flows out of transubstantiation. Okay? And all of it, as you see, shows a reverence for these ordinary elements that belongs to Jesus Christ alone. If you've been in a Catholic church, you may have noticed that at the back of the altar... There's a box, a golden box, and it's called a tabernacle. And it stores the, the Eucharistic elements, the bread and wine. And it's called the tabernacle because, uh, due to transubstantiation, they believe Jesus is in there, essentially. There's no other way of saying it. But that's where Jesus is housed in that church. Just as God dwelt in the Old Testament tabernacle, Jesus, through the elements, dwells in the, in the box. In the, in the back of the sanctuary. And so when a Catholic parishioner enters the sanctuary of the Catholic Church, he's supposed to genuflect. He's supposed to bow on one knee toward the tabernacle. Okay? Think about that. And now in his commentary on the confession, Robert Shaw adds this. He talks about the actions of the priest. When the priest is supposed to have changed the bread into the body of Christ, he adores it with bended knee, and rising lifts it up, that it may be seen and adored by the people, which is called elevation of the host. It is also carried about in solemn procession, that it may receive the homage of all who meet it. And in short, it is worshipped as if it were Christ himself. I hope you can see that all of these actions by parishioners and priests are against Scripture, contrary to the word of God. Um, Jesus tells us plainly how to properly take the sacrament. As the minister, I'm to pray for God's blessing on the supper, and then the elders and I distribute the elements to you, to the congregation. And then Jesus gives us very simple instructions. He says, take, eat, and drink. That's it. That's it. He doesn't say kneel before the elements. He didn't parade the elements around in front of the disciples, nor did he tell them to do that. They sat down at a table for a meal, and they ate ordinary bread and wine. Yes, the elements are consecrated by the word of God and prayer, but they're consecrated, understand carefully, they're consecrated in their purpose, in their use. They're not consecrated in their nature as if they change mystically into the actual body and blood of Jesus. That's not what we mean when we say the elements are consecrated. We talk about their consecration, the consecration of their purpose. But the Catholic Church says otherwise, and it's that belief in transubstantiation that's led to all of these superstitious and idolatrous practices that the Confession talks about in paragraph 4. And so the Catholic Church then commits... Uh, we have to see this. We have to be willing to say this. They commit the same sin as the Pharisees, whom Jesus rebuked for teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. That's what's going on here. And all of this ties back to an earlier chapter um, in the Confession, chapter 21 on worship. Paragraph 1 in that chapter says this. Let's be reminded. 
but the acceptable way of worshiping the true God is instituted by himself and so limited by his own revealed will that he may not be worshiped according to the imaginations and devices of men or the suggestions of Satan under, in, under any visible representation or any other way not prescribed in the Holy Scripture. When church leaders invent teaching, they're adding to Scripture. When church leaders then require members to abide by those teachings, to abide by those inventions, they are binding the consciences of believers beyond the Word of God, and in doing so, they're abusing the sheep that are under their care. And this is why it's important to examine a church's practices through the lens of Scripture alone. And so when it comes to the Lord's Supper, or to any of the other worship practices we have here, we strive, um, imperfect as we are, we strive as, as, as your pastor, as the elders, we strive to do all things according to God's Word. Because it's His Word alone, friends, that is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. That ends the lesson tonight. It was a bit